13. And the video is, uh, it's, a, it's a fun message. It's something to think about, uh, especially March 29th. It's our EOBO day. Everyone brings one. And it's just a video to challenge you guys. We're going to talk a little bit about that today and also next week as well. Now, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. All right, amen. It is good to be saved. It's good to be in church. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at two verses here. Uh, Paul writing here to the church, and this is uh, applicable to us. Paul writes, ye are, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, not uh, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of heart. Let's pray. Father, again, it is good to be saved, and it's good to be in church. And Lord, we ask you to bless the message, Lord, and especially uh, just we ask you to bless our outreach campaign as we're uh, really trying hard to invite someone to church, and we want to grow the church, Lord. And it would only uh, occur if you allow it, Lord. We ask you to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, by review, last week we started a new series and a new campaign. Uh, the, the campaign is simply Church Growth, and the name of the series is EOBO. And again, EOBO stands for Everyone Brings One. We're really going to try uh, March 29th. Uh, you know, we might have to be this guy, you know, pick up the guy, <laughs> throw him in the car. Uh, some of us, may, you know, we're good. next week we're going to talk about different tactics and, and things. Uh, but last week was kind of an overview, uh, and we focus on a few things. But uh, again, just by review, uh, everyone brings one. Now, according to the anthropologist, we looked at this a little bit uh, last week. Uh, these are people that study human behavior, the human condition. They study custom, beliefs, relationships. Uh, they study everything from a small tribe on a remote uh, island uh, to what goes on in New York City and throughout the world. They study social customs, the beliefs of mankind. They study how we live, how we react, how we shop, how we do things a certain way, our human relationships, who we hang out with, and who our friends are. Right, now, you know, these uh, doctors here, they say that the human brain uh, can condition itself on, and, and limit on, on how many meaningful relationships that we can actually uh, keep track of. Uh, the experts say that most people have five friends uh, that they consider to be like their best friends. It could be a spouse, uh, a best friend, a family member, but these are five intimate, close relationships. Then we have upwards of 15 uh, close friends. These are someone that you trust, someone that you generally could spend some time with, enjoy their company, tell them a uh, little more personal things about your life, all right, and they're fine too. Uh, we have about 50 friends that we would invite uh, to a family dinner or, or, or a family event. And we have up to 150 uh, casual friends or acquaintances that we could invite to a large gathering like a, a wedding or, or a big party. Now, I'm not going to focus on the big numbers. I'm not going to focus on the 150. And, and we're going to focus on just one. We're going to focus on you're the one. All right? You're the one, the one that you're praying, the one that you're asking God to say, God, who is that person in my life, my friend? It could be one of, the, uh, one of your five close acquaintances. It could be a hundred and, one of your 150 casual acquaintances. We'd say, God, who is that one? That one could be your coworker. Right? It could be your spouse, your child, your family member. Uh, again, your coworker, your neighbor, uh, someone uh, that works for you. All right? It could be someone that you uh, work for. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. You know, Don's not here, brother Don. He's in Florida on vacation, but uh, I'm his lawn guy. And after a couple of years of kind of asking and bugging, I, I finally got him to come, and, and he's been coming pretty regularly now for a year, praise God. And, and I'm someone that I work for, I work for him. Right? It could be your auto mechanic, all right? It could be your nurse, your doctor. Uh, it could be your dentist. Now, I made fun of dentists because I don't like dentists. But, you know, dentists, they need, they need the Lord too. It could be a waiter or a waitress at your favorite restaurant that you may see on a weekly basis. All right? 
The one could be your mail carrier, your garbage man, your barber, your hairstylist, the sushi guy, your teacher, or someone that you teach. Right? It is someone that you have a, a somewhat you know, relationship with. Like I said, it could be someone intimate, or it could be just a casual, you know, casual relationship. Right? Why the one? Well, why the one is because the campaign is about church uh, growth. It's about multiplying disciples. It's about growing the church. All right? Uh, why? All right? Is it just a numbers game? No. You guys all have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And wouldn't you want, you are the one to have that thing as well. All right? The church, we are commanded by the Lord to keep on winning people, keep on inviting. It, it, it never stops until he returns. Okay? Uh, why the one? is because you love that one. Right? You may want that one. In fact, you do want that one to, to come to the saving knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. We want the one to have, uh, to feel God's love and to have a relationship with, with him. We want that one to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We want that one to become born again. Why the one? Jesus said so in Matthew 28. He said, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things uh, whatsoever I have commanded you. All right, so Jesus has given us a command. We are to go. All right? All right, we might not have to go throughout all the world, but our little world of sphere of influence is right here in, in New York, right here in Long Island. That one could be any one of your, of your contacts. All right? We've got a biblical commandment uh, from the Lord. All right? And before you know, we do like the man there in the, you know, in the video, before we kidnap, abduct, hijack, or coerce, or bribe the one, uh, we needed to deal with a few things. And last week we looked at uh, why church programs fail. All right, we want to make sure that we try to do this one correctly. And again, uh, just by review, some of the reasons why church pro uh, programs fail is that, uh, just I'm going to rapid fire this because we went over this last week, but I, we are, there's a few people here that weren't here so they can hear this. Uh, why do church pro uh, pro programs fail? Uh, Christians have a no sense of urgency to reach the lost people. Number two, many Christians and church members fail to make friends outside of their Christian friends. Okay? Remember, we are in the world. We're not of the world. Right? Your barber, your hairstylist, the letter carrier, they might, they might not be a Christian, but that is someone you have a relationship with, and that is someone that you could say, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. Okay? Uh, number three, why do church... Uh, Programs, outreach programs fail. Uh, sadly, many Christians are apathetic. Apathetic means uh, showing no interest, all right? No enthusiasm, no concern. Listen, Jesus can show up, you know, at any hour. We ought to be concerned. We ought to be concerned about the one, all right? Number four, many church members think it's the, it's the pastor's job or paid staff. Um, listen, uh, I, I'm an evangelist by heart. Uh, I, I love this stuff. I love evangelism. I, I hand out Bibles, tracts. I invite people. But it's not just me. I, we're, we're the church corporate. We all got to get, get in on the thing here. Right? We can all do this. All right? Another reason why church programs fail is that uh, some people just come to church. They, wanna, they want their needs fed. Uh, needs uh, to be met, but they don't really think about meeting the needs of others. Now, listen, I believe in taking care of us first. Uh, we need to do that. All right? We need to love each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to help each other. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And if you need help, I'll pray with you. If you need help within the church, we can, we can do that. But we also have to think of others as well. All right? Uh, another reason why church uh, programs uh, fail is that... Uh, People, you know, Christians believe that we're that we are in retreat mode. Uh, we believe that you know society has just become so wicked that it's not even you know approachable. We believe that we're in end times. And listen, I know it's discouraging. The church has lost a lot of battles, but in the end, remember, we win because Jesus has already won. All right. And before He returns, we must be busy about the Lord's business. All right. Why do church, uh, some church members' outreach programs fail? Uh, some Christians don't want to share the truth of the gospel uh, because of political correctness, because of blowback from their boss, because people, have, you know, their friends are going to think that you're kooky or something. And uh, listen, um, you know, God gave you some wisdom. 
All right, you don't want to stand in the middle of office at 10 o'clock in the morning and start preaching. All right, your boss is paying you a salary to do a job. Now, if you have an opportunity during lunch or or, or uh, you know off uh, you know a job you know encounter, then hey, you can, you can invite your coworker to, to church. All right. Also, why do some church programs fail? Uh, is that some churches have lost their focus on making disciples. Uh, some churches have been nothing more than a community center instead of a New Testament, you know, life-giving, uh, soul-winning church. All right? and lastly, number 10, why did some church programs fail? Is that, uh, this is just true, and I'm not like, gonna pick on any, anyone, but uh, a lot of Christians are working two jobs, they work on Sundays, uh, Sunday has not become like the day that it was, like say when we were maybe growing up. Uh, there's a lot of things that society, you know, puts on us. So uh, even uh, a quote Christian, it's a struggle for them just to come to church, you know, once or twice a month, and they're not committed. All right. Now again, before we you know invite that one, we've got a couple of weeks now before the before the 29th. Uh, we need to deal with ourselves before we reach out to them. Now last week. We looked at how we to examine ourselves before God and that we should be right with him. That's why we had communion. Uh, we need to trust God. Uh, we need to trust the outcome. God just said go. He didn't say everyone you invite is going to say yes. In fact, probably it's like 90, you know, 5% of the people <laughs> you invite are probably going to say no, but don't be discouraged. God will bless you for it. It might not happen today or this week. It may happen next week. It may happen uh, in a year. But we need to trust God and we need to trust the outcome. All right? Now, that was just kind of what we you know, looked at last week. And I just wanted to set that up now. Uh, what I'd like to do is focus on this morning is our, um, well, let me say, last week our message was our accountability towards God. This week's message is that we have an accountability also to our, the one, uh, to mankind, to society. Paul here says in our opening text, look with me if you could please, at 2 Corinthians uh, 3, uh, verse 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Paul is just complimenting the Corinthian church here. He's just saying, hey, you know, you're, you're known of all men. You're a good church. Uh, he's complimenting him here. Now in verse 3 he says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Right? Now throughout the Bible we have found out that Christians have been compared to many different things. Christians have been uh, compared to as being branches. Uh, Christians have been compared to as being salt, the other salt. Christians have been compared to being light, okay? Uh, we're going to let our lights shine, all right? We've been compared to as sheep. Now, Paul says here that you are a, an epistle. Now, what's an epistle? An epistle is a letter. Okay, you are a living letter that has not been chiseled in with a rock or a pen, but the Holy Spirit of God has written a letter on your flesh, on your heart, and you are to be known of all men of your living letter, your living, uh, your living epistle, uh, epistle. All right, you are a living letter written by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, letters interesting and uh, you know it's kind of odd but we don't get a lot of letters in, in the mail we still get some a lot of things are done by text and email and stuff but letters traditionally carry uh, many types of different messages there's the friendly letter there's the thank you letter letters of congratulations when someone uh, graduates college or, or accomplishes something uh, there's letters of sympathy uh, when, when a loved one passes and you write a card to them uh, there are love letters, right? Uh, I wonder if my wife still has the couple of love letters that I wrote, you know, that are, you know, the, you know, that I, I, I was, you know, uh, I'm getting a little older, but I was quite the romantic back then, and I, you know, but I, I, I penned a couple of them. Now, has anyone ever received a Dear John letter? Do you know what a Dear John letter? Some of us do, some of us don't. 
A Dear John letter was when you were in World War I or World War II, if you had a girlfriend, you got the letter that says, Dear John, uh, I got a new boyfriend and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not your girlfriend anymore. And they call that a Dear John letter. That's a sad letter. Some letters are written uh, in bold for emphasis. Uh, some letters are written containing italics to highlight something. Uh, some letters are short. They get right to the point. All right. Some letters are long, like, here's my 10-page letter, please read this. Okay. Uh, some letters carry urgent messages. All right. Again, going back to something like World War I or so, they used to send little letters on a little piece of paper, okay, and they would tie it to a pigeon's leg, and it would, the pigeon knew to go back to the commander's post 10 miles away, and the commander would say, oh, I got a message from the lieutenant. Oh, we need to, you know, send up the cannons another, you know, 50 yards. And... <laughs> That was an urgent message, and that's how that's how they got the you know that's how they got some of their strategy done. Some letters are informative. Uh, some letters announce things like a wedding. Some letters demand, like you don't pay the credit card bill, <laughs> and what happens the next month? You get the letter. Oh, you owe, and here's the late fee. Okay, so we have different types of letters, but as a New Testament Christian. Paul says that you are a living letter. And to say you are a living letter that the world is to see when it reads you. Let me tell you something. The one that you may be praying about or thinking about inviting the church, they probably know that you're a Christian. They know your lifestyle. They read you like a letter. All right, so we need to, you know, we need to be accountable to God, but we also need to be accountable to your one here. We're going to talk about this uh, this morning. All right, each believer's life becomes a letter to not just the one, but also to those around and to those in the world. Each week you write another chapter uh, in your lives for your special, the one to see and to read. All right, have you ever thought of yourself as a as a letter? Have you ever thought of yourself as a living piece of communication? All right. Someone has said that the only Bible that some people will ever read is the Bible that they see in you. They, you hand them a Bible, <laughs> but they'll watch everything that they do. They'll read you like a book. All right. God chooses a willing vessel. And God chooses a living letter. He has chosen us. And he has used the Holy Spirit of God to write that letter on our hearts. Okay? His thoughts, his feelings, his love, all right? His salvation plan, his message is all to be, and has all been written on our hearts and is to be conveyed to, to the world. All right? And a question I ask is, how can I be a better living letter. How can I be a better witness for the Lord here? Well, here's a few tips. Just a few moments here. I like to, you know, take a look at the characteristics of a letter. All right, number one, first of all, a letter is written to convey a message. Now, God has designed every believer to be a deliverer of the good news, and that is by letter. You are being a living letter. It is the news that God so loved the world. All right, the message is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the message of the letter. Our living letter must be filled and guided by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul says it here in 2 Corinthians 3. All right, the, the, it, the letter here is not written with ink, but the spirit of the living God. It's not written on a stone or on a piece of paper. It's written on our hearts and that the world may see you. All right? You are a living letter. And when you have the Holy Spirit of God guiding you and has written your letter, you ought to be happy. Acts chapter 13, verse 52 says, And the disciples were filled with joy with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost of God has written a letter in your heart. Be joyful. Be happy. Christians ought to be the happy people. You're a holy letter. You're a special letter. You're a joyful letter. You're a letter that has been led by the Holy Spirit of God. You're a letter of love. The ink on your letter 
is holy ink. It is from the Holy Ghost of God. It's not written on stone. It's written on your hearts. Christians are meant to be living letters of Jesus Christ, delivering a message of the good news, the message of God's love. And we have a message of hope for a lost and dying world. You know, I'm, I tell you guys, I'm not an expert, but I'm, I definitely research this stuff out about Google, and we search everything. You know, we search. You know, how do I cook Irish stew? How do I do this? One of the, one of the you know, top searches is what, is what is hope for the world? People are looking for hope. And as a living letter written on your heart by the Holy Spirit of God, you have the answer. You have the message. You have the, the letter of hope. All right? We have the message. We have Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have the book. All right? We have the Holy Bible. We have the organization here. We have the church. We have each other. We have brothers and sisters in the Lord. We have the message of hope. We have the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us. And our message this is not a complicated message. We have a simple message. All right? Paul says in earlier, just in chapter 1 here, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, the gospel message is a simple message. All right? Acts chapter 16, verse 30 says, And they brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Is that not a simple message and answer for hope? When your friend says, What must I do to be saved? How do I go to heaven? How can I do? How can I become a Christian? We got the answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Yeah, very simple. Not, not, not a 10-step or 500-page book. We, and we got the answer to the test. We got the answer. We got the message. What must I do to be saved? I'm looking for Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Another thing about a letter is that a letter is written to be read. Now, sadly, most of us, when we get the mail, <laughs> what do we do? We junk, garbage. You know why we don't send out postcards anymore? I'll tell you why. For five years, we sent out 5,000 postcards to the neighborhood at a cost of $1,300. And in five years, we spent about 7,500 bucks and not one person came. You know why? People don't read the mail anymore. But, 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 I spent a few bucks on a Facebook ad, update the website, Get in touch with Google, and people will find us that way. That's just the way things are. Listen, I get, we get postcards from the neighborhood church. I read them. I look at them. I'm like, wow, this is cool. But I know I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm in the, most of you, Bill, Bill, junk, 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 recycle bin. That's it. Church, eh, that people don't look at mail. All right? But a letter is to be written. A letter that is written is to be read. Every Christian ought to let your, the one, your friend, your special person, the one that you plan on inviting, and also everyone else around, let them read your open, living letter. Those Christians who uh, really don't do much for God, or maybe they're Christians in name only, are nothing more than a forged document. All right? There are many whom we associate with every day who will never read the written Bible, but they'll read you, and you ought to be the living letter, the living Bible to them. Right? Part of our visible life and being a living letter is telling others about Jesus. That's why we're here. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him on whom they have not heard? And whom shall they hear without a preacher? These are three questions. How are we going to find out about the message? How are we going to find out about God? How are we going to find out about Jesus? And what we need to do is be that living letter of hope, of an answer, and give them a message that can lead them to Christ. Right? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now listen, I'm a preacher, but you want to know something? You're all preachers, all right? You're all preachers as well. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, go ye and preach the gospel to every creature. 
Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. All right? It is the power of God and to salvation that everyone that believe it. We are all ordained of God to invite the one, to tell people about Jesus. All right? Let's be a little bold. Let's be courageous. Let's not be ashamed. Let's trust God. Let's ask for some wisdom in the thing. You want the church to double this year? You know, we've been hovering, you know, I kind of count, you know, in the, and we've been hovering, we can have 30, we, we, we kind of, we got 30, we can have 50. If everyone shows up, you know, but hey, you want to have 75, 80, 100 people? You know, not just on March 29th, but maybe a year from now? EO, VO, everyone, everyone brings one. And let the Lord, you know, do business with them. Let the Lord save them. And then, hey, it's not just, it's not, again, please, this is not a numbers thing. More people mean more what? It means more people in the choir, more, more people uh, helping out in, in different ministries. It's, it, it makes uh, the church, listen, even like financially, it helps out in being able to, you know, offset some bills and being able to, you know, do some, uh, do some things. It, it enables us to do more outreach to the community. You know what the plan is? The, I'm jumping ahead like, the plan is this. Instead of spending money on Facebook, newspapers, postcards, Google, bump, 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 is to grow the church and then take that money and not do it in advertising, but put it into people. All right? We want to have programs. We want to be a blessing to, to the seniors, to the kids, to the community. All right? I mean, listen, Mark Zuckerberg is making a ton of money. <laughs> we want to take those funds and we want to, yeah, we need to outreach. We need to, you know, you know reach the community. But eventually, we, we want to pivot and take that money and put it into, you know, listen, I'm sure this, this piano has probably been here forever. You know, I say, hey, do you think we need new pianos? You're about to, yeah, we need one. <laughs> pianos aren't cheap. Okay? We need to invest our future funds in, in our church and in our community here. And the way we do that is by outreach and also by you being a living letter and reaching out to those so that we may grow, all right? Our living letter is a message of hope. Our living letter is an action of hope. Paul tells the church in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You see, a living letter a living letter is just that, it's living, it's breathing, it's active. What are we to do? Listen, we're in church, that, that's great. But Paul says we are, we are to do good works. Right? We are to do good works to the one. <laughs> okay? We are to do good works to the community. Our love letter is a letter of action. And our action involves good works. Right? Let's do some good works for the one and let's encourage each other. All right, Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works. Now, we are not doing good works to get brownie points for the Lord or, or, to, you know, uh, or to get our salvation. We are already saved. We are doing our good works unto the one or unto mankind because we are Christian and we love them and we want to help them. That's all. That's the, that's the result of being saved. We're not working to get saved. We are saved, and now we're going to start doing some work for the Lord. All right? This means getting out of the church and into the lives and to be seen and read of by your, the one. Good works is love. Good works is help. Good works is patient. Good works is going the extra mile. You know, sometimes you're the one that's going to ask you to do something and you're not going to want to do it. How many people love dropping off your friend at the airport? <laughs> right? Come on, let's be honest. Oh, JFK, no, never going to LaGuardia. I mean, <laughs> for, hey, that's what they got Uber for. How many people like helping their friend move from one apartment to another? Like, yeah, I'm going to give up a Saturday. I'm going to help you lag your old, your old smelly bed down two floors and throw it in the U-Haul. Yeah, and maybe you'll buy me a hot dog. We don't want to. Come on, let's be honest. Let's be honest. But sometimes you're the one that's going to ask you for a favor. And this is the time to say, oh, God, you passed the hang, okay? All right. All right. 
I'll, 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 take it, I'll take it to the airport. Now, don't anybody call me up and ask me, best time you can go to Florida tomorrow, can take me to JFK. I'll be like, what, bad connection? <laughs> Cell phones come in, broke it up. Hey, but hey, we have to love and is, is, and go, is going the extra mile for the one. The third thing about a letter is that no, not only is a, written, a letter written to be read, but a letter should be legible. Okay? Um, I have bad handwriting, okay? Um, no, if, I, if you get a letter from me, it's gonna be in all capital letters. I'm sorry, it looks like a, uh, you know, like I've kidnapped a ransom note or something, but I cannot write like a capital T than a small A. I, I just T, bah, 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 bah. Yeah. But you can say why, because I want you to be able to read what I'm writing you. <laughs> Praise God we've got, you know, computers now where it, can all get, it all looks perfect, right? But uh, I have gotten some letters from people, and I'm like, man, this is, this is chicken scratch. I can't even read this thing. What are they trying to say? And they write on the left side of the paper. They don't use common. I, I thought I was bad. But as a living letter that you must live your life be, before the one and before others, they ought to be able to read every sentence, every chapter in your life. All right? Why? Because you don't know it, but they are reading you. Okay? As Christians, our message is, becomes unreadable when we live contradictory lives. Too many times people don't want to hear what we're saying because they're already looking at what you're doing. All right? We live one way at church and we live another way at home. We can sing Blessed Assurance, you know, on Sunday and Tuesday we can curse like a sailor in front of the one. All right. You are an epistle written in our hearts, known to be read of all men. When they see you, do they see a Christian? Or do they just see a, just a fellow, you know, just a fellow lost person? All right. When our lives are inconsistent, we send mixed messages that are already confusing to a confusing and lost world. All right. We are designed to carry the message of eternal truth but all they see are is the blots and the marks and the mistakes and the sin and the, and the wickedness of our own lives. You ever, you ever yell at someone? You ever been jealous at someone? You ever curse at someone? You ever cheat someone? You ever lie to someone? And then there you are. Hey, uh, I'd like to invite you to church. And you get that little smile and I go, what you've done to me the last couple of years. Right? We ought to be a living letter. Even a living letter is a letter of forgiveness. Sometimes we need to go to the one and say, you know what, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I apologize, please forgive me. And you want to know something? Probably one of the wisest things you could ever do, because then when you ask that one to church later on, they're going to say, wow, that person showed some sincerity. All right? Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering. What is long-suffering? Long-suffering means putting up with their nonsense. It's not chop their head off. It's okay. i got to be patient with the person. It's to be gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, meekness, temperance. Against there is no law. If we live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit. You know what that means? Brooklyn, New York talk. Right? You walk the walk, you talk the talk. Or is it you talk the talk and walk the walk? All right. You say, why? If you call yourself a Christian, then live like a Christian. All right? You walk the walk, you talk the talk. Why? So your one can see how you talk and how you act. All right? So I want to let you, you know, all know this morning that every man, woman, all right, is an open, living letter of Jesus Christ. Every Christian is an advertisement uh, for the Christian, uh, for the kingdom of God. We judge the shopkeeper by the goods they sell. We judge the craftsmanship uh, by, by a contractor. Right? We also judge churches on their members. Right? I want to, you know, one thing people, like visitors and people compliment, you know, so pastor, the people here are nice. And I say, you know, amen. You know, I want to project that image. I want Windsor Avenue Bible Church to be known as a friendly church. I want it to be known as a giving church. 
I want it to be a church where this is a, a, a church family. We're a family of faith. And when you bring the one here, we don't want them sitting by themselves, isolated, and nobody talks to them, or they feel uncomfortable. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, group swarming the person. Oh, we love you, we love you. We're, we're going to scare them off. But just be friendly. Just be nice. Right? We're all going to be bringing our one here. And isn't going to be interesting? Sometimes we're a little too comfortable with our little 35, 40 people. But imagine if we had 75 people. Like, oh, man, what do I do? People, ah, coronavirus, ah, what am I going to do? All right, I'll close here. We're winding up here. Just a few tips on reaching out to the one. And we're going to develop this a little more next week as well. But how to be that living letter to your one. First of all, you need to pray and ask God for opportunities uh, in, in a developmental relationship towards the one. Right? Um, sometimes the one is going to approach you with a problem, or it's going to approach you with the take me to the airport, or just wants to have a little phone call. Pray for opportunity and that, that God will give you the wisdom to, to just have a nice, meaningful relationship with that one. All right? Number two, be authentic. Be real. All right? Um, don't use big words, you know. Just like the guy said, hey, I'd just like to invite you to church, Mr. Little. That's all. Be real. I hope, listen, I, I hope I project that. I'm the, listen, I preach hard. I, I can jump up and down. I can scream. But the minute I'm off the pulpit, I'm like, I want to sit down. I want to have a chicken wing. I want to talk about baseball, the Mets, you know, and the weather, and how you doing. And I want to be real. So we should all be real and authentic. All right, Paul said, for God is my record. How greatly I long after you. Paul had a record that God knew that he was genuine. All right? Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the words of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Be genuine. Be a faithful friend. All right? Be that honest, loving friend. Communication is important. Number three, engage in a conversation. I, and again, not just about church. We work that in later. Talk about the weather, their health. Their sports, a movie they've recently watched, show some interest in them. Be a listener instead of a yapper. All right? James chapter 1, verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Some, you know, in New York, it's, well, how you doing? That means hello. But sometimes you say, hey, how you doing? And they, you know, they're telling you the tale of woe, and they've trapped you for 10 minutes, and you're like, Oh, I'm going to listen to this guy. He's got a knee injury. Neighbors like this. But hey, we need to listen. All right? We need to show some encouragement. You say, oh, you got some problem? Someone ever complains about a medical problem? You want to know what you say? I'm going to tell you. This is the truth. When you say, hey, how you doing? Oh, is that the doctor? And if, hey, let me pray for you. They're going to be like, what? Yeah, let me pray for you. Yeah, God, he'll, he'll old Miss uh, Susie here and help her in her, in, her, in her knee problem. In Jesus' name, amen. They're going to leave thinking you might have been kooky, but they're also going to say they showed some interest in me. All right? Also, number, uh, number four, uh, excuse me, number four, you may have to, you know, you may have to have a basic knowledge of Christianity. You say, why? People may ask you spiritual questions. All right? Paul, Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, uh, uh, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of hope. Sometimes people know, I don't want to talk about the weather. What, what's the deal with that church you go to? What, do you really believe in Jesus Christ? Is he's God? And it's like, whoa. You need to have, a, a, I'm not telling you to, you know, mem you know have, a have a basic knowledge. We have a doctrinal statement of faith right out there on the table. Read about it. Yeah, have, have some, have, be able to have, uh, answer some questions that they might ask, right? You need to have the right attitude, okay? All right, again, be happy, be humble, smile, all right? Number six, again, remember, actions speak louder than words. All right, remember, you're a living epistle, we ought to do good works. All right? Number seven, lastly, be committed. All right? Don't give up. Don't be a quitter. Don't be a part-time Christian. Paul wrote to Timothy later on. He says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed. 
You know why some people are, are not going to say, say yes to your invite to church? Because they know you don't go to church. They see your car in the driveway on Sunday mornings. They see your barbecues and they, they, they see you going out. You know, they, they know that you're, they want, you want me to go to church? You go to church, you know, once a month, once a year, you know? Right? Be committed. That's important. Right? You bring them in, let God's grace save them. All right? E O B O. All right? Everyone brings one. Next week, we're going to have a little plan. It's going to be neat. Yeah, it's got, believe me, this is going to, we're going to help you. You know, I'm not just going to tell you. We're going to we're going to give you some materials. We're going to give you some things on how to invite the one. And we'll have probably another little two minute video as well. Amen. amen. All right, amen. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for today, and Lord, I thank you for the message. And Lord, we do want to be uh, a living letter in front of uh, not just the one, but even as a church, we want to be a, a living epistle uh, to the community. We want people in, in the Oceanside, Nassau County, New York City area to know that there's a little church here uh, that loves them, that cares for them, that wants to bless them, Lord. And we just want to be a, a faithful church, Lord. And Lord, we ask you to bless this, this uh, church outreach program, Lord. Uh, we're not doing it for money or numbers, Lord. We just, we just want to... We want to see this church is more active. We want to see more lives change. And I know that we are all praying for that one in our lives, Lord, that we know that if they had you as Savior, Lord, that their life would be uh, much greater. We love you. We thank you. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Ted if you can come on up and pray. And then the choir here will bless us with a... A uh, nice closing benediction song, and then we'll have a nice uh, pizza fellowship lunch. I'm looking forward to a little pizza. So, thank you, Brother Ted. <laughs>